Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Motivate with Coach Camp. I, of course, am your host, Coach Camp, and we are down here in these amazing studios of SRP with Mr. Derek Michaud. This week's episode is pretty uh, amazing. It's pretty amazing that we've been able to put this together, and I really do appreciate the individual that's come in today. Um, as you guys know, firefighter, paramedic, done this most of my life. And so we do some shows from time to time that highlight uh, whether it's somebody I worked with before or somebody that's had a connection to firefighting or they just they have stories from that that they can share that obviously is going to help my audience. Uh, So I know I have a large firefighter paramedic following out there. And uh, this week's guest, he uh, he's got a lot of story to tell. He's still doing this thing. His name is Mr. Keith Norman. He now currently works for the Tennessee Air National Guard. He is a deputy fire chief and a retired from the Memphis Fire Department in 2020. His story is going to be very, um, I I tell you, it's going to be very impactful, and we have a lot of things that kind of connected us. So at this time, welcome with me, Mr. Keith Norman. How you doing, sir? I'm good. Good. So thank you for coming down to the studio. What do you think Uh, about it, man? uh, It's it's quaint. It's quaint? Yeah. It's nice. It's got nice lighting in here, right? So you uh, you just got off work? I got off work this morning. uh, Wow. Work a a 48-hour shift. It's 48? Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, Interesting. For our small department in call volume, it works great. Every time I go home, go home for four days. So it's two days, four days. Yep. Two days, four days. Yep. Seems like a lot can happen in two days. On a normal department, it would. On our little department, it does not because we're kind of back up for the Memphis Fire Department at the I airport. I got you. So Seems just, like a lot could happen at the house in two days. Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's a couple hours, and it's like, are you serious? The air condition's out now? It's, and it's like, well, It seems like it always, all, it always happens when I'm at work. Yeah, so 48-4. That is interesting. Is there like a Kelly day in there or something? No. No, nice. we, we've got three shifts, so it's 48-4 uh, wow. with three different shifts. Similar to what Memphis does with the 24-3 three shifts, we yeah. just do it with 48s and 4. It's great. Could you imagine if they did that with Memphis? It, I don't think it would ever work. I don't think it would work on the ambulance for sure. Yeah. No, not with not with the call volume they have. No, I, trust me, I felt that one too many times over. So uh, right now, here's the story. Here's the backstory to this. So your brother and I, we have a connection, yeah. and um, we're going to get to that point. So to start towards that direction, tell me a little bit about where you're from growing up, and obviously your family, and I know Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, we grew up, we were both born over here in Memphis. We grew up in West Memphis over in Arkansas. Mm. So that is, you know, if you heard him when he was at the station or at the funeral. Light and bright. Light and bright. Go Hogs. Mm-hmm. Huge Razorback fans. We're that makes not, sense now. We're not UT fans. Yeah. Uh, but we, I've been over here almost as long as I've been over there. But I'm still a Razorback. We grew up over there, graduated over there. And then once careers happened we started moving over this way so did you have any other brothers or sisters no just me and him just you and jeffrey and what year was it or how old were you whenever you came were you the older brother i was older i was two years older okay uh yeah and you guys what time did y'all come back over to memphis did y'all both make the decision at the same time let's go no. let's move to memphis no uh so i graduated in 1988 from high school went the college route he was two years behind me he went the college route uh, I didn't get on the fire department until 95 mm. and then he came on in 2002. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was thinking about it last night. You'd mentioned at one time, something about, did we follow each other? Yeah. And I don't think we ever intentionally did or even talked about it. But after I graduated high school, I had a job at Graceland. I was a security guard for a couple of years. Really? Well, Did you ever right see up- Elvis? No, it, he's not there. I thought I did, but it, yeah. he, I couldn't catch up to him. Yeah. Um, about the time I quit Graceland, he started working in Graceland. Really? I went from Graceland to FedEx. Hmm. Before I quit FedEx, he started working at FedEx. Interesting. I got in the military in 90. He got in the military in 92. Did he ever mention to you that maybe you were his idol? No. He was trying oh, to live gosh. up to what no, you were doing? No, we were roughhousing, wrestling Whooping each other, brothers. So typical brothers. Yes, typical brothers. Yes. But clearly, he looked up to you. Well, he, just never he, talked about he, it. He looked up up to me until the time he got taller than me. Then he looked down to you. Down yeah, that me. is an that is an interesting fact because one thing about his brother, his brother's super tall. Yes, I didn't realize he was six seven. He's six seven. I just know when he stood next to me, yep. I was very underneath his line of sight. You, you, we usually were noticed when we came in a room. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You guys didn't play basketball. 
He did. He did. Yeah. Did y'all play any other sports? No, that was it. Wow. I played a little basketball, but he played more competitive basketball. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Six foot seven, I imagine. So, yeah. so did you guys have any family members that were fire, EMS, police? No, we were the first. So no first responders in the family? None. Uh, what about military? We, my, my dad was in the Air Force okay. in his early years, and all of his brothers and uh, brother-in-laws were all military back. He was the youngest of four, and they were all World War II veterans. Mm. So, yeah, there, there was oh, a wow. military connection in our family, uh, and, and I used it for college, and that's what got me in it, and he followed in it. Uh, but no fire, first responder, none of that in my family. Yeah. Kind of what got me started, I think I was probably at the end of the generation who grew up watching Emergency. See, that's exactly what got me fired. Yeah. I don't know how old you are, but I mean, that's I'm, what I watched growing I'm, up. I'm 54 this year. So you're just a few years older than me. Yeah. So I watched Emergency. That was not my career plan. Yeah. But once I went into college, I got in the military, I became a firefighter in the military. That's kind of what uh. sparked me. And then my college roommate, my first year, his dad was a lieutenant on the fire department. Memphis. Yes. Mm. And when I got hired, he ended up being my first lieutenant. How about that? So it, it really worked out great. Enjoyed it. And that's what got me started. Jeff's, Jeff's life plan gut went from college to then he wanted to get on the fire department when he did. And he just ended up yeah. mirroring a lot of what I it's did. It's funny how sometimes the dots get connected. You don't realize that they're actually connecting until you have some time to look back on them because uh, the similarities actually are kind of it's right on point, actually. I watched Emergency growing up. Now, as a kid, I've got pictures of me as a little kid yeah. with the fire gear on, doing the fire kid thing that you do when you're six years old. Yep. But um, at that time, of course, you, you're going to be everything when you grow up, right? So oh, it's going to yeah. be everything from a firefighter to a police officer. I was going to be in the military, and I was going to be a professional baseball player. Yeah. I didn't know how all of it was going to work out. I was just going to do them all at the same right. time. He even, he even considered being a, a police officer at one time. He just really? wanted to go in that service thing. And I was like, when, I, when he told me that, I'm like, nope. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I was already on the fire department. It's like the you already knew the lifestyle. Yeah, well, you're not going to be a police officer, right? So that's nothing, good advice from a big brother. Nothing against them. No, but I said fire department will be much better. Hey, look, let me tell you, Keith. Full disclosure: I have an associate's degree in criminal justice. I was going to be a police officer, and just before I got out of the military, I had a guy move in next door to me. That was on, he was in the Air Force. He was uh, he was on the fire department yep. in the Air Force, and he started telling me about their schedule mm -hmm. and all, and then the girls. And I was like, well, it does sound like that you're better liked as a firefighter, uh, I think, in some areas. I think so. you're equally respected. I don't think yeah. citizens feel as intimidated by us. Yeah. Because and, they always know we're coming to help, whereas a lot of times the police officers have to deal with you're coming to do in something the, they don't in the middle of something to do. exactly yeah. get a speeding ticket even yeah. yeah plus it looks cool in the turnouts so i was thinking to myself wow this, yeah you get that soot on your face you look dirty you look like you've been doing you're something a man yeah, yeah. yeah so all of a sudden i was thinking to myself maybe i'll be a firefighter when i get out and it only took and i say this and i want people to understand it's weird because if you don't relate to this then it probably does sound crazy but something about that first time i made a fire and the adrenaline mm -hmm. and the smell of the smoke, it's just like, oh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I was yeah. immediately hooked the, on it. The first fire, the first good working fire that I made, I was I was assigned to a, a truck company coming out of fire school, mm -hmm. Truck 7 in Orange Mound and everything. I was going to ask you where you were first signed yep. to. Truck 7 in Orange Mound, it's 16s. Uh, we made a fire on South Parkway, and the day, that day, I was riding outside. Mm -hmm. So the outside crews in Memphis, driver, backseat, you do the roof work. That's right. First fire, I got up to the roof, cut my fire, my hole real quick. I didn't know what else to do. I sat up there and looked. So you were enjoying the view. I was enjoying the view, <laughs> and I got made fun of until most of those guys went somewhere else. Norman, what are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing up there admiring your hole? Yeah. I said, it's a really nice hole. Like, I've got a hole now. But that's what you told me to do. Now what? Yeah. Now what? I didn't know what else to do. So yeah, that's funny. Took a break. So uh, how old were you at that time? Uh, I was... 25 when i started so i was probably 25 yeah so it's yeah. first work in fire 16s by the way for people that don't know one of the busiest stations in memphis yeah not that fun. there's a lot of slow stations in memphis anyway not, anymo not anymore no but that's definitely what was one of the hot ones if you will it was um is that where you stayed for a while i was on truck seven for 23 years between 16s and at one time they moved us to 22 so i was in that orange mound area the mm -hmm. majority of my career and finished up at the sevens 
enjoyed it down there, had a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I was, I was on busy companies my entire career. So being in the heat of the action, you obviously know that there's a lot of danger anyways in firefighting mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. Um, you're getting exposed to this all the time. Yeah. And at some point, is your family, your brother, are they like, hey, look, you're crazy? Mm-hmm. Maybe you should find something different. Because I know I had friends that did not understand that. So my first year, my first year and a half, I can't remember when it was. So my, my parents knew my lieutenant from me being That's right. my roommate being in, his dad. She she had talked to him about take care of my baby. Yeah. Well, about a year and a half into my career, I got hurt at a fire bad enough to where I spent the couple nights at the med. Mm. Had to got burned, got trapped in a house fire, had to get pulled out. Mm-hmm. So that was like a slap in the it's a up, wake up, up against the head. Hey, sure. this is serious. It's real. And, yeah. and, and I got through it, but I never forgot it. Mm-hmm. My entire career, if I ever. If I ever made a fire any time in my career and got a good mouthful of smoke, I, I, it would flash you straight to that moment. It was quick to flash back to that moment. Absolutely, those yeah. those moments define you. And you know, for me personally, obviously, I had some situations. If yeah. you want to call it that, I had situations. And uh, if you can't grow from there and learn from there, right, you got to go from there because you can't keep doing something if it becomes a problem. But if you learn from it, it right. gives you tools to work that, with. That, and that's I've told several people that I said. You know, you'll never forget it. Never forget it. But if you let it weigh you down, yeah, it will almost ruin your career sometimes. You've got to learn from it and be able to handle it and, and uh, work around it. It puts tools in the toolbox that yeah. you wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. And I can reflect back on a time, one of the early fires I made, and you know you do the right-hand, left-hand search mm-hmm. pattern stuff when you go into a house, and I got disoriented. And it was so crazy because when you're disoriented, you start to feel panic. Yeah. And when you start to feel panicked, all of a sudden you can't feel things that you feel. Like I couldn't feel where the door was and I couldn't feel where a window was. Yeah. And you think that it has to be somewhere in this area. And it was in that area. Yeah. But you think you're not feeling it. It's and just not where you want it to be. It's it's like in your mind you're trying to picture it, but you can't see anything. So it's right. pitch black. And I just remember coming out of there and the thought process to that was, you know what you went in on. And if you turn around and you stay on that, you know it will lead you back to where you need yeah. to go. And so if you get panicked and you start trying to go in different directions, yeah. you're, t- you're completely out of sorts. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and things like this don't happen. People think, oh, you get lost in a warehouse or this huge apartment. It happened in house. a three-bedroom, two-bedroom This happened house. in a shotgun house, See? Two, you know, two floors that had been added on to maybe five rooms in the whole house. Yeah. And something fell down in front of the door. And I couldn't find the door. See? And it's all it takes. It's all it takes. And it's pitch black. People that you yeah. see TV and shows as if you've never been in a house fire. It's nothing like TV. You can't see nothing, nothing. whenever it's smoked up. Close your eyes, put a wrap around your eyes, mm-hmm. make it even darker. That's that's part of the feeling. That's right. That's not even all of it. And and I'm building part of this story because what I'm c- catching from you is the same thing I have, which is probably the same thing a lot of people have that get into it. There's a small bit of naivety about the safety of what you're doing because you go Mm -hmm. into it, you've been trained. And if you've never faced a problem, you think things operate a certain way. And early Mm -hmm. in my career, you get in there and you fight the fire, you knock it down, you come back out, you got the hose line, you cut the hole. Things have happened orchestratedly. Most of the time things go like it's supposed to most of the time, thankfully. And and, and a lot of it, you know, me being in battalion six, battalion three, where you were right up in battalion five, the, 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 at the early part of my career, those were the three busy, hot battalions. You're going to get a lot of action. A lot of action. Muscle memory was always a big thing. Bingo. Where, you know, you could almost go into a house, you could tell where the fire was, it was automatic. Mm-hmm. Where if you went for two or three weeks and didn't make a fire in that first fire back, you're, oh, that's you do get rusty and stuff. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. And, it, and it's that quick. But if you're repetitive and everything, you, yeah, it's muscle memory. So the benefit to that, of course, is you're more efficient. You're thinking ahead. You're not yeah. thinking in the moment, which anticipation is key in our in our line of work. Yeah. Any kind of first responder work, you need to think ahead if you can. And you can only do that if you had some experience in your belt. You can't read it in a book and know it all the time. You've right. got to be able to understand the situation you're in. But the downside to that can be a small bit of complacency, sometimes a distraction even because you're not as on edge because right. you're not as aware of everything that's taking place. You're thinking too far ahead sometimes. And when something starts to take place, maybe you miss it. Yeah. And uh, it sounds vague, but it's not because I've been on a lot of calls where 
something was going on. It wasn't always a fire call. It could be an EMS call, car wreck, whatever. <laughs> Somebody brings my attention back to the moment. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we yeah. need to do this. Because I was thinking five steps. I was doing a chess game. Yeah. And for that moment, we needed checkers. Right, right. And, and, you know, as I got older and became a lieutenant and became a company officer, that's what I'd always try to do if we were on an EMS call and, and in the back room of a house and the family's all up front is – You've always got to make sure you've got somebody that's watching over that's right. your crew and in, in your in the scene because there's no telling what's going to happen. Safety operations are, yeah. in, I mean, it's what's on every fire scene, and you need that on EMS yeah. scenes, obviously, yeah. and certain ones more particular. Yeah. Well, so, you know, in 2002, you said your brother Jeffrey yep. came on the department, and um, two years younger than you. Turns out I came on 2002, September yeah. 23rd, and um, he was in my class. Now, he would have told you. Camp is crazy, <laughs> which he's not very far off. Yeah. I was always a jokester. Um, we got, as uh, Jaquan Talbert used to say, yeah. extra exercise because of me because I would say some kind of funny, some kind of quip. All of a sudden, we're all jogging. We're carrying a ladder. Every class has one. It was me, uh, and I own it. And so, you know, Jeffrey didn't get caught up with it as much as I was because I was with the paramedics. So there came a yeah. part where we separated out. But for a little while, we were out there training together, and um, – Great personality, kind of quiet. Very quiet. Wasn't wasn't Very real dry. extroverted, yeah. Right. But, you know, the thing I loved about it was I was always making jokes, and he would come back in with his jokes, but you're yeah. right. It's kind of dry. It was like a yeah. British wit. Yeah. It, we're, I mean, our personalities are real similar. We're just – we don't get in the in the party, hey, this is me kind of – we're just like, we'll sit in, stand over in the corner. I'm here if you need me. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to be the focus of the attention. Right. Yeah, but he, yeah. but you couldn't miss him. Oh, you couldn't miss him. Six foot seven. Right. He's going to be. And early in, his, early in his life is bright red hair on top of it. Oh, yes. Good point. Good point. Yeah. So he definitely stood out, uh, but definitely not the centerpiece of a party, yeah. but a good personality, great personality. Yeah. So we go through the fire academy together, and we, and I don't know if you knew this, but like our fire academy was ridiculously long. Yeah. It's like eight months long or some yeah. craziness. We threw ladders for five weeks. I don't yeah. even know. I think y'all had one of the larger classes too. We had a big one. It was yeah. 150 something, I think, yeah. when we started. My, mine, when I came on in in '95, was 72, oh. and, and we were considered large then. And you you were large then, but yeah, yeah 150 something, you get lost in the shuffle. Exactly. And uh, unless, unless you're six seven with bright red unless hair. Unless you're six seven with bright red hair, it's true. You know, I got two redheaded kids, by the way. Hmm. I know. I'm still looking for that guy. I don't know where he's at. I don't know. That was me a lot of child support. But uh, so Jeffrey and I, we come out of the fire academy, and I'm not sure. Do you know where he was assigned initially? He, he initially went to 14C. Oh, so he was right yeah. up the road. Yeah. He so went to he, Battalion 3, yeah. 14C, which is right next door to us at 16s. And then within six months, he was moved to 10s, which is, you know, that kind of happens with new recruits and everything. They get yeah. shuffled around a little bit. And that's, that's where he ended up at 10s and stayed for several years until he made – Driver. Yeah. And you know what's funny about that is, so coming out of the academy, I went to the tents. I was on B shift. For some reason, I didn't remember when he came over there, but I mm -hmm. knew that he was there. I didn't. I knew he didn't start out there. Right, no. So he was at the 14s, and I was on B shift, so probably didn't see each other a lot. The first year, you don't get to do a ton of overtime. Right. You're still getting, you're learning the job. But um, ended up, he comes over to the tents. And, you know, I was there straight out the box, 2002, and in June – of 2002 or 2003 i'm sorry june of 2003 lieutenant trent kirk was killed in the family dollar store fire mm -hmm. and that was my first real wake-up call yeah. to the danger of the job right. so much so i even looked at changing jobs it, it, it will do that to you it was a real eye-opener um up to that point we had been involved in some sketchy situations and some house fires and stuff, but nothing so much so that I didn't feel like we were quotation marks safe. I felt like the things could have been mitigated and nothing bad would have happened. And Lieutenant Kirk to me, because he's been on several years, you know, he's a Lieutenant and right. I just felt like this guy's a superhero. Right. And yeah. so nothing's going to, and then whenever that happened, it's like, Oh, if it could happen to him, he's invincible. He's not invincible. He's not invincible. And it can happen to anybody. Yeah. So I really looked at, man, I was, I was thinking about veterinarian. I was looking at a lot of stuff. And I was like, it, it I got to make, make a decision. You, it will make you think. And, you know, the thing is you can't do that job. You can't be a firefighter or a paramedic or a police officer with hesitation in your mind. No. That hesitation is what will get you hurt and the people around you hurt. It can. 
and you have to be calculated, but at the same time, you got to be able to act. You can't mm-hmm. be frozen in fear in fear of action. Right. And so I had to come to terms with some stuff and I did stay there for another few years, maybe two years, three years. And then I was becoming very comfortable with what we were doing. So that's when I moved on to sort. And then mm-hmm. whenever I left there, I went over to where rescue two was at the 36s. So yeah. I was no longer with Jeffrey, but we would still cross paths from time to time. Yeah, and same. I knew that he was probably going to be a battalion chief at some point. He was very smart and he, was. he had great people skills, which once you get in upper management, I think it's as much about people skills as it is about knowledge of a, of a job itself. It, it's it. it. Probably becomes two thirds of the job. I would say so. And so he had all those talents there. And I was like, well, I have a lot of classmates that's going to be way ahead of me. So I got to study hard on the EMS side, right? That was my thought process. But we ended up, um, where did he, how long was he at the tens? I don't exactly remember, but I know he was there until he made, got promoted to driver. Yeah. And then he went from the tens to the 38s. Okay. No, 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 no. He went from tens to 39s at first when he made driver. All right. He was there. A year or two, I believe, and then transferred over to 38C. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. down off of what, Horn Lake Road? Yep. 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 So he's over there, and at that point in time, what year was that? Do you remember? No, I don't. Okay. Because at some point after I had been at the 36s for a while, I, uh, I end up injuring my shoulder, and it's not working out. And so I end up going over to engine four area. Unit 31 to try to get, take a break. Yeah. Yeah. Cause shoulder was jacked up. Eventually I go from there out to the Academy and start teaching. So Jeffrey and I kind of had separated out. I hadn't seen him as much at that point and didn't know where his career was, but he was clearly on the South end of things. And it was probably, I would say 2015 when I started seeing the writing on the wall for me after three shoulder surgeries, yeah. that things were not going to continue well. And so by 2016, I had retired out and that from there I went to teaching and I know Jeffrey was still on the job Mm -hmm. doing his thing. And when was it he made Lieutenant? Do you remember the year? It was the year before he, uh, he died last year in 23. So he made Lieutenant, I think it was early 23 because he had only been a Lieutenant just under six months. Okay. Because he was starting to look into possibly transferring to another station. Yeah. And you always have to be you're on probation for six months. Six months, months right, yeah. Uh, so he was just under that six months. Okay. So at that point, he's uh, – he, what station was it he initially went to? Was it to the 10s? He initially went to 10. So Engine straight 10 out B. of getting yeah. promoted to lieutenant yeah. goes to the and 10s. It, and enjoyed it there. Sure. I mean, he, he he's, they started getting a good house. I, I've, I taught, work with a guy now that worked at the 10s with him, and he mm-hmm. said he blended in – just like he was one of everybody else. Of course, he'd already been at the tens. He knew That's the tens. He knew the territory. Is that in the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. So he was he was enjoying it. He just yeah. didn't know if he wanted to stay there. It's interesting too how sometimes things cycle. Because mm-hmm. I started out on truck nine, yeah. and I was the driver of truck nine when I had my last injury. Yeah. So I started and finished on truck nine after circling the city, getting reassigned back to the tens on yeah. truck nine at the very end of yeah. my time. And so he comes over to station ten. He was on engine or the? He was on the engine. He was on the engine, B shift. Yep. Guess where I was at starting out? Engine 10B. 10B. Yeah. And that's where our, that's where our ties kind of come together on that. And we are going to hit the rest of this conversation. And some of this part I need everybody to, to really cling on to and pay attention to. If you have family members that are in first responders or you yourself are a first responder, you're going to need to hear the rest of this. So I'm going to ask you, hang around for just a second. Come back after these messages. You do not want to miss it. A great opportunity awaits. The Motivate with Coach Camp podcast is now in its second season, and we are excited to say that we have listeners all over the United States and in 19 countries. If you have a company and you're interested in some very affordable advertising while at the same time supporting a great cause, please go to motivatewithcoachcamp.com and fill out that sponsorship page, and we'll get right back to you. You can support the podcast through donations on Venmo at Motivate with Coach Camp. Thank you to all the listeners and guests who have blessed this podcast with their engagement and involvement. Welcome back, everybody, from that little break. All right, so I've been sitting here talking with my friend, Mr. Keith Norman. Uh, We've been discussing all things fire. Uh, 
retired from Memphis Fire Department in 2020. Now he is a deputy fire chief over at the Tennessee Air National Guard. And um, he and his brother and I, we, we came on the fire department together back in 2002. And we had some intertwining moments throughout our career, uh, both working at the TENS early in our career and then me ending my career there. And then at this point in time, Jeffrey gets promoted to lieutenant and goes to engine 10 B shift at the same spot that I was at truck nine B whenever yeah. I finished, or actually I was on a shift at the end. So I was on truck nine a at the end. Yeah. And so Jeffrey comes back over to the tens and how long had he been a paramedic? I mean, I'm sorry. How long had he been a Lieutenant when he got there? Uh, he, he, he got promoted and that was his first assignment. So in 2023 he gets there and he's got a years of experience. He's been a, a driver. He, he, Yep, been in private for a long, a good amount of time, was yep. a driver for several years. And then once he was eligible to promote, he actually got to ride out of rank a okay. lot. Okay, and, that's and, and yeah. even more so than I realized, uh, he, he rode out of rank quite a bit. So, riding out of rank for anyone that doesn't know, that means that you are high enough on the promotion list that whenever they are short a person for that position, in this case, we're talking about lieutenant, he can ride in the lieutenant's position even though he's not made that actual rank yet, mm -hmm. which gives you experience. Plus you get, you know, pay for Lieutenant for that yep. day and stuff. And that's the same for driver chief, all the yep. positions that are just ahead of you. If you are in a spot close enough to be promoted, you get to ride out of rank. So that gives you experience before you actually get to that spot. It, it does. And it gets, you, it gets you experience, you know, around different parts of the city, yes. and trucks and pumpers. And so, yeah. and he, and the thing to note too, is in 2023, he had already been on over 20 years. Uh, yes. So, I mean, he had a lot of experience, yes. a lot of knowledge yes. that is needed, and that is important. So then, on what day was it where he makes the fire? I believe the, the fire originally started and was dispatched on the 18th of July. Okay. And then around 11-ish. Mm -hmm. It was in the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, and then we... His, Wife was notified, and I was notified on the nineteenth. Okay, so that that the nineteenth is the official um, day that he died. Yeah. So on July eighteenth, at about eleven p.m., Jeffrey responded to a house fire, and what I built this story to uh, for you guys to understand fully is that when you hear house fire as a firefighter, you are paying attention you're aware but you're not your signal levels are not up it's not always that you're nervous or scared of it you get there you see where the fire's showing you set up a game plan of attack you pull the hose you make entry if it's something you should you can make entry on if it's too far gone you surround and drown right so he gets to the house fire and clearly it was presenting in a spot where they felt like all right we can go in we can make entry we uh, can put the fire down yeah. Yeah, uh, from what I mean, of course, all mine is secondhand knowledge from yeah. what I've been told, and I've been told multiple stories, uh, but they all corroborate. Uh, Engine 20 was initially first on the scene and started attacking the fire, but they were around the corner. This, this house that they went to was not normal for the neighborhood. It was ex extra large compared to what the other houses were. It had a lot of add-on add build yeah. on. Uh, so Engine 20 was there in from what I've been told, they don't think tw Engine 10 realized they were there where they were. Twenty Engine oh. 10 was on the opposite corner. Got you. Uh, so I don't think 10s was on the initial attack, but they were, you know, the second end pumper is usually re going in for rescue and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's what their position was. They were on another corner of the house. And, and so for people to understand, too, so if you're a lieutenant, uh, typically you have a nozzleman. Yep. They're holding the nozzle of the fire hose and they're making entry with their pre-connect and the lieutenant is directly behind them. So that it's the second person in they're together. They go in together. Um, lieutenant obviously is there for guidance and for support because let's just face it. Water hose has a lot of pressure behind it. So you need yep. two people on it. So they go in, they make entry and they're, they're putting water on this. And so I'm assuming then what you're saying is engine 20 had come in and they were putting fire on, putting water on the fire from the opposite side. Yes. Uh, from what I yeah, from what I've heard learned, uh, they were attacking the fire, and Jeff was kind of trying to make their way into where they were. I got you. Uh, things were going on in the house. I think, I think to the point to where 
20s and engine 10 and then truck 9 were there, I think they were starting to get pulled out. Okay. 10s had to come, or 20s had to come out the way they were, and then 10s and truck 9 were coming out the carport area. So they were on their way out, out of the house. The, out of the house. Yes, and, and we're actually out of the house, but the house had a carport, and from what I understand, truck, I think one of truck 9's privates, something had fallen on him. And the lieutenant, their lieutenant and that private, they were trying to come out. Jeff turned around to go back in to get them, help get them out. Mm. Uh, and there's another private from truck nine there. They got the two off truck nine out. And about the time those two guys were getting to the edge of the carport, Jeff and another private all got to the edge of the carport. The carport fell. Mm. The entire weight second floor of the carport the carport had a second floor above it fell out and came out kind of chased them out so like it pancaked toward them it pancaked toward them caught jeff uh it caught the lieutenant and the private from truck nine but it caught them lower Mm -hmm. up down on their legs so they were still not completely covered jeff was completely covered with another private under him wow um so that's what i've been told uh that's what i believe now um and his last actions, he was trying to protect his private. Yeah. And so how, how did they get to them? How did they get the private out? Uh, they rescue two, had to, had to dig and cut, and they say it took them several minutes yeah. to get them all out. And I think Jeff was the last one to get out. They had no communication from Jeff once the house fell. There's yeah. nothing on the radio. They have no, I was told there was no evidence that he took another breath. Yeah. So the collapse itself, mm-hmm. the, the private that he had shielded, how did he fare? Uh, he, 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 he hurt his back that night. He was actually at the trauma center that night when I got there. Wow. And, and the funny thing is he's about the same size Jeff is. Wow. Yeah. He's, he's, I walked in like, who are you? Two big guys. He, he's a big, tall guy. Yeah. But, yeah, Jeff, and he'll tell you, said, Norman saved my life. Man. His last act was the act of heroism, which is what we do, right? Yeah. yeah. And you realize that. Yeah. And, you know, I was a lieutenant. I got promoted to lieutenant in 2001, actually on 9-11. We had a promotion ceremony. So I'd been a lieutenant by the time I retired 19 years. I felt like I had quite a bit of experience as a lieutenant. Yeah. So, you know, thinking Jeff is a six month lieutenant, like, man, does he, does he truly know what he needs to know to be a lieutenant? Yeah. But his last act was getting his crew out. He, he knew what to do and he did it. Yeah. Well, so that night, how do you guys get the news? Uh, his, I got it from his wife. His, uh, the fire department sent a division chief to his house to pick his wife up. And while they were en route to the hospital, she's frantically calling me at, you know, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, why, is, why are they calling me? And so yeah. I called her, like, like, are you trying to call me? And she's like, you know, something's happened. Yeah, you need, They're taking me to the med, but I'm on my way. I didn't know a Nissan Rogue could go 95 miles an hour. Wow. But the one my daughter had can. Yeah. Because I going down 40, down. 40, yeah. down, 40 into Poplar in a Nissan Rogue, I got there relatively quick. Man. But it was, it was crazy. I mean, everybody is out in the ambulance bay of the, of the med. I recognized very few people mm. because I'd already been gone from the fire department three years and it's amazing it's crazy how the turnover. much turnover in the fire department yeah. has seen in the last few years so i was just looking for a familiar familiar face to get me in the building because yeah. everybody i knew that had talked to me were already in the building mm. and i finally got a hold of somebody and they're like he's in here did they let you know before you got there i did not know so, yeah. but as i'm walking in the room where his wife is the doctor's telling her you know, the, I think that anytime anything happens that's tragic, 
the, one of the questions that people ask is why, how they want to understand the scenario. They want to understand how does this take place and could something have been done different? Yeah. And just from the story you tell me there, it, it just really goes to speak volumes to the fact that you can't take life for granted. You can't take the job for granted. You can't let your guard down. And he didn't do those things. And yeah. when the moment happens, sometimes it's way beyond your control. There's nothing you could have done different, could have foreseen anything that was going to take place. Right. How many houses do we go in and it doesn't collapse on you? Right. You know, how many times? Dozens, maybe for some hundreds. And so it, it sounds to me like, that a moment like that, you just have to chalk up to, yeah. it was just everything fell right to be wrong. Yeah. And, and you know, how many houses kind of chase you out of the house? That's true. I mean, it's fell toward him and, and, and it just him. doesn't happen that way. But you know, from what I've heard and I tell, try to tell them every time I see them. Yeah. Rescue two and engine 29. Excuse me. Uh, work their butts off to dig all four of them out. Yeah, and, and gave him the best opportunity he could. Sure. Now, I know with my experience, he was he was dead there. Yeah. But they did what they could. So that's the question I have for you: is how how do you wrap your head around that doing the job for as long as you've done it, and now knowing, you know, that the family's looking to you for answers at yeah. this moment. Yeah. And so how how does how does those conversations take place? Hmm. They're not easy. No. Um, I get asked a lot of questions by my, by my mom, especially, you know, yeah. why, why was he even in there? Yeah. Well, that's, that's his well, we role and position is that, is that Lieutenant, mm -hmm. he's supposed to be in there. That's right. Um, that's what, I mean, I told her, I said, when I was a Lieutenant, I was inside. That's where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's where he was. That's where he's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've been able to explain a lot, some of of the what he was doing, where he was doing, why he was doing. Uh, but they, you know, the fire was to, deemed a, an arson fire, so that they they want somebody to pay for it. Yeah, and, and I, I I tried to repeatedly tell them, say, look, I could I can't tell you how many arson fires I've made in my life. And nobody's going to get held accountable for it. Yeah, it's just it's a it's a determination that they make for the fire. They can say, "Oh yeah, it's a, it's it's an arson fire." Some somebody we feel started it, but tracking that person down, you're not going to find a an, an end, a, you know, a finish line for it. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a just, lot of fires are arson fires. Yeah. The, I wouldn't say the majority. I don't know those numbers, but there's a lot. There's a lot, especially in Memphis. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of old houses, old vacant houses. And people burn them down. And, and, yeah, and this house was vacant. Like, mm -hmm. why is he in a vacant house? Because you don't know it's vacant. In, in Memphis, and we always Squatters say in, 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 the busy, in the busy in the busy battalions in Memphis, it's never vacant until That's you true. know it's vacant. Yeah. So you have to go in and make sure nobody's in there. That's right. Um uh, because that's that's what firefighters are there for is it's life and property. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, and I've had to kind of help it, his wife understand, you know, why was he doing this? Or I was same thing with my mom. It's, yeah. Just trying to help them understand why it may have happened. So did they did they use you as a resource for the guys on the company? Because. I know like with Lieutenant Kirk, they had people coming in talking to us. You being the brother, did they have you come in and speak to the guys that were on shift? They never did. Mm -hmm. uh, we we met all the guys at the station, and, yeah. I, and, I, and they, I, I knew a few of them mm -hmm. from being um, on the department so recently before it. Uh, nobody ever asked me to come in. I, I mean, I never told anybody I didn't want to. I always felt like, hey, if y'all need me to talk about something yeah let me know i'll talk to you or um i did the one the one guy i mentioned that was his private that i met at the hospital that night we we kept in touch pretty good mm. uh, we talk every once in a while uh and and, and i can kind of tell when he talks it, it's kind of a um he's he's coping with it you never get it's, over it you never get it, it, but you learn to deal with it. And, and like I told the, told him, I, I 
spoke at the uh, at the funeral. It's it's. I told everybody that was there that day. He said, "You're never going to forget this." It's, no, it's, it's just like my incident early in my career. You're never going to forget it Mm-mm. ever. It's it's how you take it and put it in your back pocket and use it going yeah. forward. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on. There's a few, but one of the reasons why is because I wanted people to understand the survivor story, the people that go on after them, especially somebody that is doing the job. I mean, you did the job and you still do that to a, to a certain extent now with the national guard, but not as much in the heat of the battle as, as I say, but for those that are out there that, that do this job, I think one, it's important to have that reality check moment, but then two, how do you move forward after that? And sometimes that's really tough. And some people don't move forward after that, especially not in the same career field anyways. Yeah. So uh, how is that guy doing? The guy that uh, he saved, is he still on the department or do you know? He is. He, is? He, he, he doesn't work at the tens anymore, yeah. uh, but he is still on the department. Uh, he said it's different, Yeah. Uh, but it, but it, I don't know if he's back to enjoying it yet, but he does get up and go to work when he's supposed to go to work and mm-hmm. he gets on the fire truck when he gets, is supposed to. So he, he's, uh, he's getting there. Uh, I think the only there may only be one person, one or two people still at the tens that were assigned there. Then a couple of them never came back from the fire. A couple of them have transferred out, I believe. Uh, I know his driver is still there, uh, and I talk to him every once in a while. He he says it's 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 different. Yeah, yeah. Just the similarities to the tens tragedy um, with Lieutenant Kirk. Whenever that happened with your brother. Um, coincidentally, there's no way you would have known this, um, uh, Trent's wife and his two kids, his two daughters were coming on the show and they came on a week after that had taken place. Yeah. And it was, it's so Miss Donna, I'm sure, you know, Miss Donna, um, she was telling me then that she didn't know if she could come on because of what had happened with Jeffrey and it was at the tents and there were so many things that were similar. And I told her, I said, I had some of the same trepidation cause we had already had it scheduled. Mm-hmm. Um, but what she understood it to be important is the same thing that I thought would be important, which is also why I wanted you to try to come on if you could, is that people need to hear this side of it. One, the, the person that was doing the job, they gave their life in a way that this is part of what we do as a firefighter, yeah. as a paramedic. You're going into dangerous situations. Yeah. So folks out there thinking about getting into it, don't take that for granted. It is dangerous. Well, it, it's dangerous, but I, I'll 100% say it's still the best career ever. Love it. Absolutely. It has to be, it has to be something you love though. It it takes, you have to love it and and it's easy to love. It is. But it's also easy to hate. It can be. It it, it takes a special person to do this job, to see the things you see, to do the things you do and come out on the other end. Normal. Yeah. And so moving forward, that's what Miss Donna said. She was going to honor Trent's memory by making a difference however she could with other firefighters that had been injured in the line of duty. Yeah. And I feel like that that is probably a lot of what your message is today is that, you know, you live to honor your brother, but at the same time, you know, yeah. it's you recognizing what we do is important, but understanding that it is also dangerous and that there are people left behind after that, that have to carry the torch forward. And you're doing yeah. that, sir. And it's not an easy story to come in and tell. No, it's, it's not. I mean, and I remember, I think you actually asked me, the first time, mm-hmm. what a month or two after this happened, and I was like, eh, I don't think so right now. Yeah. Now you're on. I'm like, eh, I'll try it. Yeah. So far, so good. Wounds, wounds take time to heal, and they never oh, go yeah. away. You know, never go there's away. always a scar there. Right. For sure. What would you What would you leave with a young person, or what would you tell a young person considering fire service or paramedic, anything in the first responder line? What, what kind of what kind of message would you give them? It's a very rewarding career. It's a tough career. But I had fun. I had fun coming to work all the time. Yeah. I mean, all the stations I was at, I always had, we always had fun, especially, especially at the sevens. The sevens, if you don't know the sevens in that territory, that, that's, <laughs> it's crazy down there. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I don't want to sound like some, expository speaker or something. It's, it, it's a very rewarding career and it's fun, but it is, it is tough. It's challenging. Yeah. I think my, my comment to it would be just to uh, embrace it for what it is that you're going to have a difference in people's lives. You you're going to make a difference in people's lives and you're going to make memories 
and it is a tough job and yeah. you will have sacrifice. You will have a price to pay, yeah. whether it's mentally, physically, and sometimes it is the ultimate price. Yeah. But in the end, you live your life for a purpose and your brother lived his life for a purpose. Yep. And there's a person alive today that wouldn't be here right. had he not been there in that moment. Yep. And so I, I do feel these stories are difficult to tell at times, but I also know the relevance to them. I know how much they're needed. I know that other folks out there that have been through trauma like this, yeah. they need to know that people can keep moving forward and that there is a better tomorrow. It's not easy. It's not. It's all in how you cope with it. Uh, yeah. Firemen have weird ways of coping with things. I've seen some weird stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, but if, if you can find a, a sensible way to cope with it, it, you can make it a career and, and retire from it and look back on it. And like, that was the fun time of my life. Yeah. You're going to make friendships that oh, will last yeah. a lifetime. You'll, you'll, you'll make friendships. You'll see things that you can't imagine. That's right. Crazy, crazy. Oh my gosh. Crazy stuff. A lot yeah. of practical jokes. Yeah. If this was a firefighter story show, we'd have, we'd run out of time. That is true. That is true. Uh, the yeah. stories that, that run deep. Um, yeah. But in the end, it is the honor of your brother, and um, I want to thank you so much for coming on because, you know, Jeffrey was a friend of mine. Yeah. We didn't get to stay together the whole time in our career. We did have a small brief period where we interacted and, yeah. you know, going through the fire academy together and stuff. But, uh, you know, having you here today and being able to tell his story, share it, that'll be out there forever. I think that is uh, it's a great tribute to your brother, my friend. Thank you. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best. Is there anything you want to leave my listeners with? No, I'm just... You did great, man. I know it was tough. Yeah, it was. I appreciate you coming I, in. I had my moments. Yeah, it's all right. Hey, guys, look, that's what this is about. Motivate with Coach Camp is about bringing a platform that is going to have some relevance and some impact in people's lives. My friend Keith here, look, whenever we talked about this, his brother gave his life. Uh, it's something that firefighters, unfortunately, are faced with. Police officers are faced with this. Uh, in the end, it's not in vain whenever you're out there doing the thing you love. And let me tell you something. This is a job, just like Mr. Keith just said. You get into it, and it's for you. You will love it. You will not regret your life because in the end, you know that it was a life of purpose. I want to thank you guys for tuning in every single week. Please continue to send me messages. Go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, and until next time, Coach Camp out. I love the chase and the hunt, and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want, and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now wake up! It's time to look at the enemy. Look in the mirror if he is no friend of me. It's not working out, maybe it's the chemistry. It's time to break up so I can make a better me. Better believe in your mind, cause it's everything. You can mold shape.